Today, I am going to review SeaWorld. No, not that SeaWorld, but SeaWorld in Gold Coast, Australia. Despite being on the other side of the world and being completely unaffiliated with the US SeaWorld chain, this park has a lot of similarities. So in this video, I will review SeaWorld Australia and explain why this park is well worth a visit. This park actually predates most of the US SeaWorld parks. Gold Coast SeaWorld opened back in 1971. The park started off exclusively with animal exhibits, but they expanded rapidly. They purchased a nearby competitor in Marineland and transferred those animals over to SeaWorld. Then they also started to add rides towards the end of the 1970s. Today, the park is owned by Village Roadshow, who gained sole ownership of the park back in 2006. This company also owns the nearby Warner Brothers Movie World theme park and a few other attractions in the Gold Coast area. And as I noted at the start, this park and company is in no way affiliated with the US SeaWorld parks. The Australian park is a space between sea and world, while SeaWorld is just one word at the US parks. But along with a very similar name, you also have an eerily similar offering at the park. Both have a balanced mix of animal attractions and mechanical rides. The parks invest similarly in landscaping and theming. Then Australia SeaWorld even had an entire land theme to Sesame Street for a few years. This is easily the US chain's most profitable IP, and they've even made entire parks themed around those characters. One of SeaWorld's biggest strengths is its location. Located just north of Surfer's Paradise, SeaWorld sits on a thin strip of land adjacent to the Pacific Ocean. The park's tallest rides give you some stunning views of the area. Conversely, you can see those attractions from the water if you're jet skiing or chilling by the beach. The Gold Coast is Australia's top theme park destination making it convenient if you're trying to visit all the area's amusement parks in one trip. The park is just a short drive away from the aforementioned movie world, as well as dream world. If you don't have a car, the park is accessible using the 704 bus line. If you arrive by car, you will park in a giant free parking lot. You then may have to wait in a bit of a line to enter the park. SeaWorld has a small entry area with just a few booths. This doubles as the ticket booth for people who need to purchase admission, and a place to scan your tickets for those who prepaid online. Most parks, especially this scale, separate those two things out. So I was a bit surprised and wonder if they may update this in the future. Daily admission costs nearly 100 Australian dollars. If you plan to visit multiple Village Roadshow properties in a single trip, look into purchasing their Escape or Super Pass. These cost 180 to 200 Australian dollars, so you come out ahead if you visit any two of their properties. These give you 3-7 to seven days of access to their parks. Once inside, you have this covered plaza with shops, restaurants, and guest relations. It feels sort of like a shopping mall. But if you look ahead, you have a giant lagoon that doubles as an arena for the park's stunt show. And you also get a glimpse at the park's skyline. Leviathan in particular looks quite imposing off in the distance. In general, I really like this park's appearance. It is clean and very well landscaped especially towards the back half of the park. Then the rides are well presented. Several had light bits of theming, but a few went above and beyond. Storm Coaster is shipwreck theming in the queue and a dark ride section at the end. Then the New Atlantis area is the park's best work. You have some big statues throughout the land, and Leviathan is one of the most well-themed stations in the world. This coaster has an eerie cavern and a sea creature traveling from screen to screen all around you. Then all the operational rides look bright and colorful, but that ties on to one black mark for the park's looks. There are a few standing but not operating rides just withering away. The most notable one is the monorail that circles around the entire property, including the parking lot. Then you can also spot the Viking's Revenge log flume over by storm. The park itself is fairly easy to navigate. Once you get around that front lagoon, there's a long pathway off to the left spanning the entire park. This has all your animal attractions off it, whether it be the exhibits or shows. Then there's a loop with the attractions towards the middle of the park that connects back to this pathway. Now I need to talk about the biggest issue with this park, the operations. There are some things this park does well, but there are other things I really think they need to work on. Let's start with the good. This park is open year-round. They are open daily, only closing for Christmas. 
One of my biggest issues with year-round parks is that they typically do not post their ride refurbishment schedule in advance, so you're gambling what may be closed outside peak season. Fortunately, SeaWorld is very transparent about this. They have their ride closures posted months in advance on their website. They will also update this page with any temporary closures, whether it be unplanned maintenance or a daily closure due to a technical issue. And this park is extremely friendly staff. This was a theme at all the Village Roadshow properties. Now let's address the bad. SeaWorld has pretty short hours. The park is open from just 9.30 a.m. until 5 p.m. daily. To make matters worse, rides open a half hour late, and if the park is busy, they will close the line so the last cycle goes out right at closing time, so plan accordingly. There aren't a ton of rides here, and if you only care about those, you probably can do everything in a half day, but you will definitely need a full day if you plan to see all the animal exhibits and shows as well. That's especially true given how slowly the rides load and dispatch. The staff members can physically check the restraints quickly, but a few of the coasters have a tendency to run just one train, and the pre-boarding policies also cause lines to move at a glacial rate. This is especially the case with Leviathan. I go into more detail about that one in my individual review for that ride. Australia as a whole is very strict with loose articles. Nothing can ride with you. This includes things in a zippered pocket, or even glasses secured by a strap. So before anyone can get seated, they need to put everything in a loose article bin. Some rides fix this issue by offering free lockers. These are used for storm coaster and jet rescue. And these are pretty big lockers too that can easily fit a good sized backpack. The other issue if you're coming from overseas is that SeaWorld does not offer free Wi-Fi and you most certainly will need an internet connection to maximize your day. Specifically, you want to be able to use the park's official app routinely. There are workarounds for most things if you don't have internet, which we had to explore due to an issue with our hotspot, but there is one thing you inexplicably have to have an internet connection to do. First, the park posts their show times there. You can look this up in advance on the website, or you can get a list of shows from guest relations but the app is the best place to go if a show is rescheduled due to weather, which we had happen during our day. Second, the park posts ride wait times on the app. The times themselves weren't too accurate, but it was very helpful to determine if a ride was operating or down for maintenance before we went over there. Third, the park has a virtual queue system. This is a free service included with your park ticket. You can reserve one ride at a time using the park app. Once your time is called, you have a half hour to return. Once you use your pass or it expires, you can book another one. And you can keep on booking the same ride over and over again if you'd so like. Return times will run out on busy days, particularly for the park's headlining attractions, so definitely plan accordingly. If you don't have internet or run into issues with the app, the park can provide a queue proxy wristband. With this, you walk over to the virtual queue entrance for an attraction. You then talk to the attendant, if the standby line is short, they'll let you write on. Otherwise, they'll give you a return time equal to the current wait. Fourth, Leviathan offers a special backwards row. This is the single best experience in the park in my opinion. The coaster itself is a fantastic ride, but it's extra crazy when you navigate the layout in reverse. I believe this price varies by day, but it costs 25 Australian dollars per person the day I visited. This price point caused a lot of the seats to go out empty more often than not, so these times are readily available until park closing. Now this is the one thing you're out of luck if you don't have internet. The park has no way to sell this to you in person, even at guest relations. I tried. Fortunately, I got my hotspot working in the afternoon, but I almost missed out on Leviathan backwards due to a technological issue. So how should you tour this park? I would start by noting which shows are a must for you. Note the show times and plan the rides around them. If you arrive at opening, I strongly recommend starting off with Leviathan. Book a virtual queue time for this ride and head over to the standby line. This is the park's most popular ride by far, and considering its atrocious capacity, it can develop a sizable queue line by the afternoon. This will allow you to experience the attraction twice in short time. If Trident is operating, and that's a big if, Reserve that with the virtual queue while you're on Leviathan, and go on that next. This is the most unreliable ride in the park, often closing for wind or mechanical issues. I would then head back to Jet Rescue and Storm Coaster. 
these two rods should still have manageable weights at this point. If they're getting backed up, book them with a virtual queue. Otherwise, keep booking Leviathan with a virtual queue. That is the ride whose return times run out the fastest, and it also offers the biggest time saving. If the park is packed, they do offer a fast track skip the line service. This oddly is not sold on the park's website, but you can buy it in person. I didn't need it the day I visited due to how well the virtual queue was working, but it looked to cost 100 Australian dollars if you wanted to buy one. Alternatively, you could purchase single shots for individual rides in the app for 20 to 30 dollars a piece. Now let's move on to the ride lineup. In terms of quantity, this park lags behind most, but they do have some quality attractions, especially with the new Atlantis area that recently opened. The park currently has four different roller coasters. The best of the bunch is easily Leviathan. This gravity group wood coaster is a fast paced blitz of quick turns and airtime hills. The convoluted layout reminds me of Kima Boardwalk's Boardwalk Bullet with all the crossovers and sudden dips. Except this ride holds its speed even better. You don't get a moment to catch your breath until you hit the brakes. Then in terms of airtime, it is all floater, but there's a lot of it. This coaster is relatively new, so it's still running very smoothly. I just hope the park can maintain it because it is an aggressive layout. Jet Rescue looks to be their second best coaster, but unfortunately, this Intamin Straddle coaster was closed for maintenance when I visited. This coaster is short in both height and length, but I've heard it is an action-packed ride. I've heard this dual launch coaster rides similarly to the second half of Jura Summerland's Juvelin, meaning it packs in some compact and deceptively forceful turns. Storm Coaster is a mock water coaster. It's a clone of another ride Jura Summerland and Skatoween. The ride starts off with a fairly mild helix, before treating riders to a great finale. You have a large drop. It's profiled a bit weirdly, so it gives a delayed pop of airtime. Then you rip over a bunny hill with some weightlessness before hitting a final splash that'll get you quite wet. Then the way back to the station, you have this indoor section with some cool theming. I have a whole review on this coaster, but it is an enjoyable ride for sure. The final coaster is SpongeBob's Boating School Blast. This is a Zamperla Kitty Coaster. It is a pedestrian layout, but it's reasonably smooth and the kids like it. Younger guests will want to spend a lot of time in Nickelodeon Land, which serves as the park's kids area. You have a few smaller flat rides themed to characters like Spongebob, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Dora the Explorer. For the adult flats, you only have two notable ones, both added as part of New Atlantis. That addition really rounded out this park's lineup. Vortex is a hus top spin with a good program. You have a slow flip at the start with lots of hang time. Then you have two sequences later in the ride with a similar flip, immediately followed by two to three fast and forceful ones. While this one does not have the theatrics of some installations, it is refreshing to see another top spin built when most parks are removing them. Trident is a 14 story tall star flyer from SBF Visa. This is the park's tallest ride, and it offers a nice view of both SeaWorld and the surrounding area. The rotational speed is slow for this type of ride, so while the thrills are lessened, it does make it easier to take in all the sights. The park also has one other water ride in Battle Boats. This is a splash battle, and there seem to be a lot of interactivity with guests on the midway, which is exactly what you want to see from this type of ride. This attraction is part of Castaway Bay, which also includes a splash pad and a big climbing fortress targeted towards kids. One ride type I'd like to see in the future is a dark ride. Storm and Leviathan show the park is capable of great theming, so I'd love to see what they could do with a full attraction. This would help on days with inclement weather. The park seems to run their coasters in the rain, but the outdoor rides understandably have to close if a thunderstorm rolls through. Along with these mechanical rides, you have all sorts of marine animal exhibits. The best of the bunch is the Penguin Encounter. This is a large indoor exhibit with multiple viewing platforms. You can watch them relaxing on the ice, or you can go below the water surface to see them swimming. Some others that should not be missed are Polar Bear Shores and the Sandy Shores Lagoon if you love dolphins. You also have some special animal encounters. These are similar to the experiences you can get at the US SeaWorld parks. You almost always have to book these in advance because they will sell out, but these are small sessions with a trainer where you can get up close to different animals. We did this with the penguins and it was awesome. It lasted about a half hour. We got to pet multiple penguins while learning all sorts of facts about them. 
These can be pretty expensive depending which animal you want to see though. Then you also have some live shows. The best of the animal ones is Seal Guardians. It is reminiscent of the Clyde and Seymour show. You have some corny jokes and the awkward movements of the seal fits that perfectly. Affinity Dolphin presentation is another fun one. The show has some dead spots, but the aerial acrobatics of the dolphins is cool to see. Last but not least, you have the Thunder Lake Stunt Show. This takes place on that aforementioned lagoon by the main entrance. You have all sorts of jumps. Most take place over the water with jet skis and boards. But there are some stunts on bikes on land. I thought the transitions throughout were sort of awkward and cringy, but the athletic accomplishments are more than worth seeing. One thing I cannot comment on is the park's food. Because of the short hours, we ate a big breakfast and used all our time doing the attractions. There looked to be several stands throughout the park though. Two additional notes about the property. First, there is the SeaWorld Resort on site. This is a well-reviewed hotel and it looks pretty nice, but it does have any special perks for the theme park. This will cost you 200 to 400 Australian dollars per night. Second, there is the SeaWorld helicopters. Despite being located adjacent to the park and bearing their name, they actually have no affiliation. I imagine they offer spectacular views of the Gold Coast, but this experience was closed due to a fatal accident earlier this year. So do I recommend SeaWorld? I sure do. This is a really nice park between the rides and animal experiences. Leviathan was a much needed addition to give this park a standout coaster. Then you have some solid supporting rides too. Then you have some incredible animal exhibits and shows to fill out the rest of the day. I just hope this park can work on some of the operational issues I encountered to improve their throughputs. I was lucky I visited on a day that wasn't too busy, but this could prove very problematic if the park is slammed. So those are my thoughts on Australia's SeaWorld. What are your thoughts about this hybrid theme park and oceanarium? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you consider subscribing, because there'll be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.